Welcome to today's second panel, Beyond Earth Orbit, Cislunar, and Lunar Sustainability. My name is Chris Johnson, Space Law Advisor at the Secure World ba Foundation, and based out of our Washington, D.C. office. So joining me on the panel, and my panelists can please uh, turn on their cameras and their microphones. Uh, joining me on this panel are Mike Gold, Acting Associate Administrator at the NASA Office of International and Interagency Relations, the OIIR. Audrey Powers, Vice President of Legal and Compliance at Blue Origin. Uh, Professor Tanya Mason Zwan, Assistant Professor and Deputy Director at the International Institute of Air and Space Law at Leiden University, and uh, President Emerita of the International Institute of Space Law. Also joining us are Jesse Kate Shingler, Director of Policy and Governance Research at the Open Lunar Foundation, and John Carrico, Chief Technical Officer, Owner, and Astrogator at Space Exploration Engineering. So, cis lunar and lunar sustainability. So why this panel? Um, well, today, to date, much of the current discussions on space sustainability have focused on challenges and activities in Earth orbit. But now, as, as you're seeing, as multiple countries and companies and actors are engaging in and planning and aspiring to engage in lunar exploration and lunar development, we need to expand our thinking. So I'm gonna post right in the chat something that I've seen uh, recently um, and, and has spurred a, a lot of thought on, on my behalf is this uh, re two, two reports. One is the, um, the ISEG report, the Global Exploration Roadmap and the supplement to that roadmap, which talks about lunar exploration. And then that uh, just a graphic from Bryce about projected exploration missions, uh, 2020 to 2030. When I look at, uh, and you don't need to look to it now, but you know, when I look at that, I see a, a variety of actors, a multiplicity of actors who are looking to go to the moon, either to return or uh, go there for the first time. So, you know, we now find ourselves discussing lunar policy lunar governance, lunar norms. Uh, what are they and are they sufficient? So this session will discuss potential sustainability challenges posed by lunar activities, including lunar resource utilization, non-interference, safety zones and heritage sites, and even lunar orbit traffic management. And hopefully we'll hear some opinions on which directions and which avenues the deliberations on these topics should go. So thank you to our panelists for joining us. I think first I'd like to start off with, uh, is Mike Gold in the room? Uh, Mike, if you could turn your camera on, I see him. I think first I'd like to start off with this um, uh, National Space Agency perspective. Mike, as, as head of the Office of International and Interagency Relations, I, can you kind of orient us and give us a kind of a global picture in terms of space activities and more importantly, uh, space activities and governance for the moon? What's the global picture? Uh, thank you, Chris. And as always, appreciate the Secure World Foundation and creating terrific uh, events like this for us to speak at. And I also appreciate that you're saying what's the global perspective, because it isn't just NASA. It isn't just the government. It's the public-private sector together. It's NASA with our international allies. Those lines have blurred, and we're all proceeding together, and I think are better for it. Uh, I know uh, this is something that's probably well known by everyone in your audience, but just for those who aren't familiar with the Artemis program, uh, Artemis is the sister of Apollo, and the name is very apt since the goal of this program is to put the first woman and the next man on the surface of the moon by 2024. In order to do so, we're developing new government commercial rocket systems to you know, carry people, to carry resources, to carry logistics uh, to the moon, the SLS uh, and the Orion to take our astronauts to the moon. But uh, there needs to be differences between what happened to Apollo. We all love Apollo, but there must be changes. And one of the great differences is in the very title of this activity, sustainability. The problem with Apollo is that it ended. Therefore, we need to have a permanent and sustainable 
exploration utilization program. And that means infrastructure. That means building the proverbial roads in space that will allow for a continual exploration program and growth. And that's where Gateway comes in. And that the Gateway will be an orbiting outpost. Uh, it will have substantial international contributions, really the physical manifestation of those contributions. And the important part of Gateway is it will enable surface operations because we need to have robust and permanent surface operations on the moon all in order to get to Mars. That it's terrific that we have a moon because it allows us to practice, to develop technologies, to build the international coalitions in order to mount the historic human mission to Mars. And let me just end by saying that the key to the Artemis program and this whole new era of exploration is diversity. It's diversity in peoples, as I indicated before, that Artemis will be the largest and most diverse international human space exploration coalition in history. With Apollo, maybe you had Australia supporting with the DISH, but with Artemis, we will lead the world going forward to the moon and then onward to Mars. It is a truly global effort. And diversity in organizations that, again, going back to Apollo, there was no robust private sector space entities like we have today. Now we can leverage private sector capabilities. We can have public-private partnerships to create technologies and systems that would have been unimaginable 50 years ago. So by leveraging and using this diversity as fuel, I think we're going to be able to accomplish things. And let me just say, for the overall purpose of goal of going to the moon, we're not only going to answer the questions that we've got, but to create new questions. And that's what's always so inspiring about exploration uh, and the human spirit. And by doing so together in partnership with our commercial friends and our international allies, uh, it is something that I don't want to say we'll never forget Apollo, but I believe that the goals, the objectives, the accomplishments that NASA and the world has ahead of it will dwarf what's occurred in the past. So back to you, Chris. I agree. I hope you're right. Um, I want to return to some of that and get uh, some, uh, you know, a couple follow-up questions. But first, before I return to Mike, I'd like to uh, now turn to Audrey Powers. Audrey, I have questions about um, your company, uh, Blue Origin, and its participation uh, and its activities and aspirations for the moon, both in terms of how you're partnering with the U.S. government and if you have this this other uh, uh, Blue Moon program that seems to be, uh, you know, it, it's kind of standalone exploration program. So just if you could give us kind of a perspective on on the different activities that Blue Origin is up to now and in the near term. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, I, I appreciate um, being invited to, to speak on, on this panel and at this event. Um, I think you'll see sustainability is, is a theme that's very much connected to some of the foundational tenets of, of Blue Origin. Um, and, and, and a brief introduction to our Blue Moon Lunar Lander program. Uh, we've been developing uh, that lunar lander for several years. Um, it's capable of delivering several metric tons um, of uh, payloads to the lunar surface. Um, we used that design as the basis of our offering for NASA's human landing system um, project under the, under the Artemis program. So we are um, the prime contractor, um, put together what we call a national team. Our partners are Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and Draper, and um, the collection of us have, have designed this architecture um, that's comprised of multiple different elements, and Blue Origin is, um, in addition to being the prime contractor, we're designing the descent element, um, which is the actual lander portion based on our Blue Moon Lunar Lander program that that was already in development. Um, an important aspect of that lander is our engine, our, our descent engine. So the BE-7 lunar landing engine um, is, is one of many engines that Blue Origin is developing. Um, 
has precision landing capabilities um, like, like all of our engines, um, deep throttling capabilities, reusability um, is, is a, 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 primary, um, a primary goal of, of that engine program. So we, we started testing uh, that engine back in the summer of 2019, and that is occurring primarily at Marshall Space Flight Center. So one of the engagements, one of the other engagements we have with NASA um, on, uh, for, for our lunar purposes um, is, is that we test our engine down at Marshall. Um, we also have um, an agreement in place with the Air Force Research Lab to test BE-7 out at Edwards. Um, so we, we have a number of different um, government relationships that are supporting our development of, uh, of um, this, the, the Blue Moon program um, more largely and then the human landing system uh, offering for NASA. So we, we also have um, Blue Origin is part of NASA's um, CLIPS initiative, which, which um, Mike and, and, and the administrator mentioned this morning in, in his remarks. So the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, um, Blue Origin is eligible to, eligible to bid on proposals to deliver cargo um, to, the, to the lunar surface. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of, that's a very, very brief overview of the Blue Moon program and, and to focus a little bit more on, sus on the sustainability piece of it since, since that's why we're all here. Um, you know, sustainability has really direct application and connection to one of Blue Origin's core tenants. And I, I imagine many people um, watching um, are aware that our, our founder, Jeff Bezos, back in May of 2019, gave a speech that laid out his vision for why exploration and settlement of space is so important. Um, and it very much relates to sustainability of Earth. So how do we stop depleting the natural resources on Earth? Um, we, we actually achieve that by moving some of our activities to space. And as we move activities to space, we wanna make sure that we do so in a thoughtful manner so that we don't just start depleting the resources out there and that we create sustainable projects um, as we're moving off of the Earth's surface. So this idea of sustainability both on Earth and in outer space is something that was very foundational to, um, to the beginning of Blue Origin and kind of keeps coming up in all of the programs that, that we develop. So if you look at our launch vehicle programs, um, from the very beginning, reusability was just a core principle of, of what, uh, what Blue Origin developed as far as launch vehicles. Um, you very much see that in our Blue Moon program too. So we're looking at architectures with our partners um, that, that, and, and really studying the best ways to reuse these elements um, so that they're not, if this is not just a one and done um, type initiative. So to, to Mike's point, how do we really establish um, a permanent presence in space? So the, the first time we land on, on the moon, we land this descent element on the moon, um, it's going to be used as infrastructure for surface operations. Um, it's not just going to be forgotten about and discarded and we can't use it anymore. Um, so we've, we've really engaged with our, um, with our partners on the national team to figure out, you know, Lockheed Martin developing the ascent element, um, which will transport crew. How do we make sure that's reusable? Um, same thing with the descent element. So this idea of reusability kind of permeates everything that Blue Origin does. Um, and I, th I think that the, the administrator made um, some really good points this morning and I should, um, you know, full disclosure, I, I have spent many, many hours working with Mike Gold um, on the NASA Regulatory and Policy Committee um, focused on some of these issues. So um, space resource um, extraction and utilization, we made um, a series of recommendations to NASA and a lot of those really show up in the Artemis Accords and the principles that the administrator spoke about this morning. This idea of um, a global perspective and really being a leader and getting everybody on the same page for how we're going to approach things like, um, you know, due regard and harmful interference and coordination of activities. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I, I've spent many, many hours with the NASA Advisory Council, um, this, this regulatory and policy committee, figuring out what we want to recommend to NASA. 
um, as far as engaging with private actors to try to further some of some of um, the leadership in these areas and the the administrator made reference to this idea of soft power and you know with soft power i think comes really strong leadership and and the initiative that, that he announced this morning this idea of extracting a resource um, and selling it to um, to NASA, I, I think that shows really strong leadership in this in this area. Um, as does the Artemis Accords, um, you know things like um, you know signing up to the registration convention if you want to be engaged in in the Artemis Accords. There there's um, there's really a nod to some of those important international tenants um, that they are furthering through the Artemis Accords, and I I think. Um, I think NASA and the and the larger U.S. industry that's connected to NASA is showing some really great leadership in this area. Um, so that's my my brief overview. I'll let you move on to everyone else. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to uh, discuss some of the kind of policy and and uh, international implications of you know recent American initiatives. Um, and I think I would first start with, as, as the administrator mentioned, that 2015 CSLCA creating, you know, private property rights over space resources, but really beginning with earlier this year, the executive order on space resources, and then Artemis Accords, and the international uh, reception and interpretation of those Artemis Accords. And now today's announcement that a state uh, would like to procure um, and purchase space resources. Um, you know, and this may be a harder question, but I want to field it to you, Mike. Um, you know, there has been a, let's say, a diversity of opinions at the international level as to, uh, you know, these ambitious American initiatives on, on space resources. So, you know, while, you know, the U.S. does this international engagement piece, what's the strategy? And I'm really asking you a strategy question, Mike. What is the the strategy to engage the rest of the world, uh, you know, with Artemis and with space resource uh, utilization? Yeah, generally, Chris, I can tell you the strategy is to lead. It's to oh, engage. Hold on. Turn, your, turn your, uh, your camera on if you've got it. Okay, good. Should be on. Yep. Yeah, so you're good. Go Go ahead. If you can see how terrific I look now, um, you know, the, the strategy again is to lead. The strategy is to engage, whether that's on a bilateral basis or in multilateral forums like COPUS or the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group. And, you know, per the presence of uh, Blue Origin and Audrey, and uh, I think I just noticed that Audrey got a promotion. So congratulations, Audrey. Well deserved as she mentioned, she and I have spent a lot of time uh, working at the NAC uh, Regulatory and Policy Committee, and I was always grateful for all that free time that Audrey would donate and, and grateful for all of her uh, thoughts. So, you know, we need to, first of all, it's important to have a program that can drive this. And without Artemis and the return to the moon and the direction that we've received, none of these conversations are possible. So I think it's important to begin with an ambitious, a practical uh, vision for space exploration. We're very fortunate to have that with Artemis. Beyond that, as we mentioned before, the problem with Apollo is that it ended. And if you want to have sustainable exploration, not only in space, but anywhere on Earth, you've got to be able to leverage resources. Uh, I grew up in Montana, so I have a great fondness for the Lewis and Clark expedition. And what I would ask people is imagine what would have occurred with the journey of discovery if Lewis and Clark had had to bring all of their food, all of their air, all of their fuel with them. That would not have been a successful exploration program. And while we can at least go to the moon without leveraging resources, we can't do so sustainably. So what we need from a broad perspective is a consensus to be able to leverage resources as the fuel for sustainable exploration, as the foundation to allow us to make new scientific discoveries that will challenge the very boundaries of our imagination, and not only on the moon, but on Mars, where the ability to leverage ISRU is going to be arguably even more important given the distances and the challenges that we've got 
on Mars, but as I said before, we need to practice on the moon, to learn on the moon in order to go to Mars, and, and even beyond that. Um, relative to, again, the global strategy, we must establish norms of behavior. And this is what the Artemis Accords are, coming together with nations to reinforce, to implement the Outer Space Treaty. I am a huge fan of the Outer Space Treaty. Over 50 years old, doesn't look a day over 35. That's the foundation that we need to agree upon and implement and then take our experiences via the Artemis program and bring those to multilateral forums to have discussions in terms of what comes next and to gain more fidelity on topics like space resources, space heritage, orbital debris, to build a better future in space than we have on Earth. Let's learn from our mistakes and go forward together. But it's important that that path that the world take be one based on openness, on transparency, on safety, on the public release of scientific information. Transparency, hope, optimism, scientific discovery, these are powerful tools that we have and we must leverage them to ensure that when humanity goes forward, not only to the moon and Mars, but into the solar system, those are the values that we take with us. We're not just taking astronauts to the moon, we're taking the Outer Space Treaty to the moon, we're taking the Registration Convention to the moon, we're taking the rule of law, and it's important that we set that as a precedent because there are all alternatives out there that are opaque, that are dangerous. So we need to embrace our values, embrace our multilateral agreements and our obligations under those and help engage with the international community to create a bright and harmonious future, not just for ourselves, but for our children, because I'm too old to go, uh, that will hopefully have that peaceful and prosperous future on the moon and Mars. That's the strategy. Great. Thank you for that, Mike. I Now, I'd love to turn to Tanya. Tanya, it seems as though, you know, the rest of the world is beginning to understand that argument that the use of resources in space is critical, is fundamental to any long-term presence in space. But, you know, in terms of international perception and reception of, of these American initiatives, um, you know, wh what is your perspective on it from abroad? And, and how do you think the international context is, is shaping up? Thank you, Chris, and thank you for having me on this panel. I think I'm the only non-American, so that question doesn't surprise that I uh, am getting that. Uh, and of course, I cannot speak for, <laughs> for the global community. Um, but uh, what I personally am seeing is that uh, indeed the United States is, is taking a leading role um, is uh, putting things out there just like they started doing in 2015 with the uh, with the the law, the first country to uh, explicitly say space resources can be owned, and that sparked a debate, and that immediately led to the United Nations COPOS uh, putting this item on their agenda. Uh, and of course, this year we have seen uh, many next steps, the executive order, the Artemis Accords, and uh, the announcement by the administrator just um, uh, an hour ago. Um, and, and, and that will, of course, uh, create a lot of uh, reactions and, and debates. But um, it, if anything, I think what it does is it puts the topic on the agenda. And, uh, and that is necessary. And I am like, I think everybody in this panel convinced that we have to go to the moon and onwards to Mars. Um, and we will need resources, so we do need clarity, and we're not going to do this only with, uh, with governments. We will have to um, involve private enterprise, which is more able to, uh, with, with more agility, to put in the finance and the technology. So that clarity in terms of rules is needed. We do have basic norms. We have uh, the Outer Space Treaties, which uh, Mike loves so much, uh, um, not a day older. I mean, the, the, the great majority of uh, UN members is, is adhering to those principles. Um, so, but, but they do not give all the answers. And so 
putting things on the table like the Artemis Accords do, of course, does not solve all the questions. And I think that uh, NASA also agrees and Michael agree that uh, in the end, we will need multilateral um, uh, discussions. And I see Mike nodding. Um, so I, I can only hope that, that this, again, these input, impetus will, uh, will create more uh, leverage at the, at the UN level. So I'm, I'm very curious what's happening. Of course, we had the legal subcommittee of UN COPOS that uh, could not take place this year because of the COVID-19 situation. Uh, let's, let's hope that there is not a further delay and that it can take place next spring. Mm, which is where also the, the scheduled informal consultations, as it is called, are, uh, are currently taking place. Uh, so the, the, the COPOS uh, members were not yet ready to accept uh, a formal working group in the legal subcommittee. And I would be curious to hear uh, perhaps Mike's view on, on whether the US would support that or any other on the, all, all of you Americans on the panel. I think that would be very important. Uh, because there you can really involve the other states. And I think everybody agrees that uh, just having the Artemis Accords, just having a national law, whether it's Luxembourg or the UAE or the US, is not enough. Um, it does give us ideas. We've had also all these other uh, non-governmental initiatives, non-formal initiatives like the Hague Working Group, which I've been uh, working in very hard, but also the uh, Vancouver recommendations, the Moon Village uh, Association, which has been working on it. So a lot of input has been prepared. A lot of uh, food for thought is on the table. And so I think the next step must be that uh, the, the, the multilateral discussions uh, continue and, and that also other parts of the world which are worried, and, and I think they have a right to be worried, uh, should be involved and should be reassured that their interests will be taken uh, into account as well. So we have that basic framework, but we need, uh, we need to take the next step. Great. Thank, hey, thank you for that. Chris, do you mind uh, if I respond? I'll, I'll respond? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just a, a bit of that because, you know, Tanya is so correct in what she says. She's always been a good professor. I consider myself a student of Tanya's, although I've never paid tuition. So uh, apologies uh, for that. Um, but per my thumbs up and violent head nodding, you know, I, I just want to agree that the Artemis Accords are a beginning to these discussions, not an ending. That the Artemis Accords, again, reinforce and implement our obligations under the Outer Space Treaty. And the Outer Space Treaty, uh, unfortunately, as much as I'd like it, it doesn't have the solutions for everything, nor will the Artemis Accords, nor do I believe we ever will. That This is inherently an organic process as we go and learn. Again, I don't think we even understand the unknown unknowns that we're going to be dealing with on the moon, which is why with the Artemis Accords, we tried to keep them at the principles level uh, to ensure that they were broad and general enough to accommodate whatever situations that we uh, run into. Uh, relative to the COPOIS Legal Subcommittee uh, on Space Resources, we absolutely look forward to engaging, engaging in a robust fashion with that discussion. Uh, as Tanya is saying, that these are ultimately, you know, issues that we look forward to hopefully resolving in a multilateral manner. But the important thing is that we have the discussion and that we have the discussion now. And that's what Artemis Accords and, and many other of our activities are meant to do. Uh, I do want to quickly, though, distinguish the Artemis Accords from the executive order and other actions. But the Artemis Accords, as I think people know, uh, that's a consensus. It's going to be a consensus agreement among the partners that are joining us with Artemis relative to those principles held not just by the U.S., but by the partners. I can tell you that we've received excellent feedback from our partner nations, that the Artemis Accords are a far better document now, having received that international input, than they were before. And again, making it a document belonging as much to the partners uh, as to ourselves. And therefore, again, very different from you know, the executive order, et cetera, because of just the inherent nature uh, of what it is. But what the Artemis Accords do is, as Tanya pointed out, we're bringing attention to these issues of space heritage, of interoperability, of transparency. How do we actually implement the Outer Space Treaty to create the safe and peaceful future that we all need? And ultimately, we'll be taking that into the international forums to have those discussions. So the Accords are really intended to spur 
and to push forward that global international dialogue with all countries. And again, fundamentally, the Accords are partners that are working with us on Artemis. So not everyone is going to be involved in that as much as we like the whole world with us on Artemis. That's probably not going to happen. But with the nations that do join us, we want to reinforce our commitment to the Outer Space Treaty and describe how we're going to operate in a safe and a transparent manner and then bring that to COPUS. Because in the end, what we're trying to do is avoid conflict, that we need to be transparent. We need to demonstrate what we're going to do and how we're going to do it so that, again, our children can have the peaceful future in space that we all want and deserve. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to open up to some of our other panelists. Jesse, Kate, you've heard of uh, this explanation of, you know, uh, the American approach um, and NASA's initiatives. You've heard Tanya's uh, give some international context for it. You know, we have the Outer Space Treaty, but is that enough? And if not, uh, how do we develop uh, new norms or clarify new norms? And what, what are some of those values? Certainly space sustainability, but if you have views on other values that we need to incorporate, um, you know, going forward to, to really have a sustainable and peaceful uh, lunar environment. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and thanks for thanks for having me, and thanks for putting on this event. Uh, you know, Open Lunar Foundation uh, works to advance peaceful and cooperative futures on the moon. So certainly, um, uh, those values are right front and center for for us and what we stand for. Um, you know, uh, I think security and sustainability are two other ones, as you mentioned, that uh, I don't think many people would actually argue with those values. So if anything, I uh, I think really what's interesting to talk about is what are we willing to to invest in to achieve those things, because at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, making trade-offs and uh, finding way finding ways to cooperate with one another. So, you know, for the sake of of having a dialogue, I thought I would throw out a few that uh, probably we haven't haven't heard um, in the Outer Space Treaty, or perhaps uh, build on what uh, the Artemis Accords are are saying. Uh, the first is from a values perspective, and I want to talk about values first because those should inform the norms. Uh, from a values perspective, I think that um, participation is a value, and I think we need new forms of participation that, that go beyond state representation. Uh, we've seen and we've heard people talking about uh, bringing private actors to the table as peers and finding voice for private actors. I think that uh, is going to be a very important thing as we go forward. It's great to have Blue uh, here on the panel today, um, but it's not just private actors, it's also civil society uh, in a broader consultative format. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity at, at COPUS or, or otherwise to see states talk about how we could carve out domains uh, where we can endorse operators to coordinate amongst themselves. The second is, is um, you know, what I would call um, plurality or polycentricity. Mike mentioned diversity. Uh, diversity will be very important, uh, but what are the implications of diversity? I think we're going to need to make room uh, for multiple approaches to coordination on the moon. And that raises a really big question because there are some things that, of course, will need to have universal acceptance. And we have a forum for that, and COCUS is exactly where I would start. Um, dust and debris is a global phenomenon. We definitely need to be coordinated on that in a universal sense. And, uh, commitments around land management and occupation. Uh, there are real questions coming up about the safety zones and the Artemis Accords. I think we need to talk about that at COPUS. Uh, but there are other areas that can be regional or topical. And so there's another concept um, that is called subsidiarity, which is the idea that we can coordinate at the most local level appropriate for a given area of activity. And I'm, I'm curious for us on that, uh, to be exploring this as an international community so that we don't only rely on unilateral you know, action on the one hand or uh, kind of wait for a consensus uh, on the other. I think there's, there's a middle ground that we're um, not exploring as much as we could be. Um, back to values, I think that um, another one that's really important is, that will bring us into um, uh, norms is, is learning. Uh, the Hague Space Resources Working Group talked about adaptable governance design. You know, I think we need to design learning loops into whatever me mechanisms we put in place so that we can not be terrified to take any action, right? If we have the confidence that our systems can learn, then we can take these first steps. 
So uh, moving into the norm space, um, I'll just throw out three that I think would be really interesting. Uh, sorry, not just interesting, important. Um, you know, I think that first is access. I would, I would say that to some access, uh, some aspects sorry, of coordination. Uh, but by the Outer Space Treaty, uh, different approaches will still need to be open to everyone to participate. And so how do we do that? Uh, it introduces some, some neat and uh, new constraints, and I think we need to make some space to figure that out. Um, and then the next one is notification and coordination. Uh, that, that is a big part of the Artemis Accords. It's obviously a part of the registration um, convention and, and the regimes that we are thinking about putting in place around that. Uh, but in terms of the norms uh, of behavior within it, I have some, some questions. One is around standards for positioning. Uh, positioning will underpin a lot of the other norms that we're talking about. Um, safety zones uh, and registration. I don't think we have the infrastructure for that. And maybe somebody like John could talk about this a little bit more, um, or even uh, Blue. I don't think we have the infrastructure or even know what the standards are that we're expecting. Um, positioning information and for registration on the norms of transparency. I think I might be. Um, and I think you may be cutting out just a little bit. So I'm going to turn to our uh, two of our operators. Thank you for that, Jesse Kate. Um, I would like to first go to John and then hopefully to Audrey. Um, you know, you've heard the, the norms that we do have, but, you know, John, first, I'd, I want to ask you, um, in terms of actual lunar, cislunar operations and activities on the moon, you do space traffic management for the moon. Um, first off, what is that like? How difficult is that? And then also, you know, how does, how does space law inform, uh, some of the activities that you do and, and shape it and provide guide rails? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you for having me on this panel. This is a, a really cool topic. Um, I want, I'll just start off with a story. In February of 2014, I was working at NASA Ames in California in the control center for the NASA LADEE mission. That was a lunar atmosphere and dust environment explorer mission. And uh, there were about four spacecraft orbiting the moon, including the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO. And uh, they were at NASA Goddard uh, here in Maryland. I was out in California. We both had teams, operation teams. And we um, were predicting that our two spacecraft orbiting the moon were gonna come within a kilometer of each other. And we detected that a couple days ahead of time. We were working uh, using NASA JPL's MADCAP system. Believe it or not, MADCAP is an acronym. Uh, for multi-mission automated deep space conjunction assessment process. <laughs> and the way that works, it's a very cooperative uh, method where you show, you give your predicted orbit uh, to the system and it will calculate for everybody who gives their orbit, which ones will come close to each other. So it's, it's very similar to the Space Data Association that we have for low Earth orbit and geos, which is kind of a cooperative nonprofit effort. But uh, JPL is doing this for the moon and for other, um, other celestial bodies. And it took a lot of work. We actually had friends in the other control centers. We were on the phone. Uh, we were talking and trying to make sure our two spacecraft weren't going to hit each other. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty when you're predicting where your orbit is. You're cooperatively tracking your own satellite. And um, the LRO mission decided to modify one of their momentum dump maneuvers. And ultimately, our LADI um, flight dynamics team, we had to wave off one of our station keeping maneuvers, one of our altitude uh, control maneuvers, just to avoid hitting. And, and this took days of work to avoid this. And there were only two spacecraft at the moon at the time. Um, so, so that's just a one example of two cooperative spacecraft, both at NASA needing this. Um, yeah, so lunar norms are now. I mean, like, yes. you know, these, yeah. these issues are real and in play. I get it. Absolutely. And as you know, in the um, Outer Space Treaty, um, Article 6 says that, you know, the states have to look and um, continually surveil what their nationals are doing, what the commercial 
companies are doing. Um, and we've already seen a commercial company. We worked on the, with Space IL on their team orbiting the moon. Um, Article 9 says the states have to detect and um, notify if any other nationals are going to cause harm. So you have to be able to surveil that. And then Article 11 says, you know, you should let everyone else internationally know as well. So um, what's happening around the Earth for Earth orbiters, is, as you know, we have um, the United States has a space surveillance network. The Europeans have um, a surveillance framework. Uh, Russians have their own um, surveillance and tracking system. And we use radars and we use um, telescopes. And there is a catalog. And um, internationally, you can work with the 18th Space Control Squadron. You can give your predicted orbit to the Space Control Squadron, and they'll tell you if you're going to if you're going to run into any debris or anybody else. It's still a cooperative thing. But those radars and those telescopes, they don't reach out to the moon. Um, a couple years ago, the United States Space Defense Agency had some notional architecture that maybe they could put 200 satellites in Earth orbit to look at uh, space surveillance, you know, space surveillance in the cislunar space. Um, and they said that was too expensive. And just April of this year, I think it, in um, one of the journals, it was said that they decided that they're not going to fund that yet. And it's going to be research. Um, just to give you a little kind of grasp of what's going on, if you took the Hubble Space Telescope and pointed it at the moon, which they've done, it its resolution is only things about the size of a football field. You know, it's, it's not going to see things uh, very well. Um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has a, has a very nice half meter resolution of half meter camera, but it has to be down at like 50 or 30 kilometers to see it. And it's very narrow field of view. It takes several years to look at the entire surface of the moon. So, so optical is really tricky. Plus, if you look towards the sun, when the moon is on the sun side of the earth, you're not going to see anything. First of all, any satellites are lit on the other side, so they're not shining towards us on the Earth. And second, um, the sun's in the way. So this is the same problem we have with tracking asteroids. If anything is on the sunward side, it's hard to see it. So um, it, it is possible to track using, you know, AsiaSat-3 used telescopes to track when they went around the moon, but it, it's, it's difficult. Um, and maybe someday we'll have radar. So right now, it's it's got to be a cooperative thing. It's got to be a thing where the, um, the the satellite operators inform other folks. You might think, well, could we do something like aircraft do? Um, automatic, you know, the um, ADSB system, the automatic uh, dependent surveillance broadcast system, where international aircraft, you know, commercial aircraft, they get their GPS location and then they broadcast it out to everybody, and they say, okay, here's where I'm at. Um, it may become surprise to a lot of people, but most satellites that are flying don't know where they're at. The lucky ones in low Earth orbit can use GPS, but beyond that, satellites actually don't know where they're at. It's people on the ground in the control center who know where they're at. And if they're in a good mood, they might tell the satellite where it's at, but a lot of times they don't need to know that. Um, second, even if the satellite knows where it's at, it's not very good at broadcasting. Um, the NASA satellites that we have can only put antennas on a couple sides of the spacecraft. There's solar panels on one side, there's engines on the other. The satellite has to be pointed in a certain way to do its mission. And it can't always talk with the Earth, let alone broadcast to everybody else. So an ADSB system, that's not really going to work. And plus, try to convince some of these um, satellite manufacturers, you know, they care about size, weight, and power. Try to convince them to put on another antenna and another broadcast. Um, they're just not going to make it through their review system if we're if the government is forcing them to add mass. So it's it's the Russian proverb: you're going to have to trust but verify. That's going to be the state of the art for the next 10 years or so. The the people who are controlling the satellites are going to have to be open and transparent. We're going to have and we already do, but we're going to have to use international standards to say this is where I think I'm going. Um, oh, I did want to mention even if you had some you know, star laboratory system that Mike Gold could probably tell you about, you know, that could track everything in space. Um, a lot of satellites nowadays don't follow orbit mechanics. They have solar electric propulsion or they're in a chaotic trajectory where if we like to use the uh, equivalent of the uh, biological gaseous outburst from a mouse is actually large enough to move 
drastically hundreds of thousands of kilometers from one orbit to another. So it's, it's really hard to predict, even if it's your own spacecraft, where you're going to go on some of these chaotic tra trajectories. And some of them go out one and a half million kilometers from Earth before they come back to the moon. So it's going to have to be some sort of cooperation like the Space Data Association or like MADCAP. And everyone's just going to have to agree and, and say, OK, this is what we're planning to do. And then when we do get a chance to take a look of you know, we might have a sensor and say, okay, yeah, that's consistent with what they said they're going to do. So it's a huge technical challenge. Okay, great. Yeah, that's certainly um, one perspective. Thank you for that. I'd like to go to Audrey. You know, Audrey, as a, as a commercial actor, private actor, you are also, you know, bound by the strictures and obligations of international space law because uh, they're imposed on your regulating country. Um, as you are active on the moon, as Blue Origin is active on the moon, it, is the current framework enough? for Blue Origin to do everything that it wants to do. Uh, it, it seems as though, you know, we've heard that perhaps it isn't. Uh, if, it, if it is not enough, then uh, how could Blue uh, influence and set precedents and, and establish norms uh, that, that suit its purpose and also suit the other, these other purposes of space sustainability? So how do you see uh, your, your role, Blue Origin's role in establishing lunar norms? I, I think what's what's interesting to me about this conversation is uh, many of us on this panel, I'm sure in the audience, has spent you know years of our career, decades of our career, talking in a rather academic way about the Outer Space Treaty, about some of these other international treaties, and what will happen when people start doing things? What does Article 6 mean? What does Article 2 mean? And we've kind of invented these scenarios in an academic setting and attempted to apply these, these you know, obligations of these international treaties to those scenarios. Now you have very real scenario, right? John just walked us through something that actually happened <laughs> in space. And the announcement by the administrator this morning is somebody go and do this for us. And we're going to establish the, the position with respect to this activity and, and the governing tenets of the Outer Space Treaty. And that is what I think is so fantastic about the, this time frame right now is that we are figuring out e exactly the point of your question. We're figuring out whether there is sufficient architecture in place in, in all of these um, international norms and treaties to really govern people's behavior. And I do I, I bit probably echoing something that, that Mike touched on earlier. You know, there, there is an obligation on the actors to buy into this stuff, right? Buy into the obligations that they're bound by. And as a private actor, Blue Origin, understanding that we have relationships with NASA and, and the, the larger U.S. government who has obligations under the, space, the, the Outer Space Treaty to understand what we're doing and where we're doing it. And, and that, the, that the obligation is not just on us, but it's a collective obligation as US actors um, to abide by these, by these norms. So I, 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 I do really enjoy the fact that we're in a situation now where we are actually practically exercising these things and everybody's interpretation is gonna be put out there for the world to see and say, this is how I thought, the administrator made a great analogy this morning, this fishing analogy, um, which I've heard many times before someplace, my goal. Um, you know, when I, when I go out in the ocean and I, and I fish and I collect some fish and I eat it or I sell it, um, that is not appropriating the, the ocean for sovereign purposes, right? That is using a resource. And, and if you draw the same analogy to the moon, for example, you know, Blue Origin's propulsion system based on hydrogen and oxygen, it's going to be very important for us to be able to extract lunar material for propulsion purposes, um, for, for to, to, to further um, use the, the materials available there um, for, for in-space purposes. And, um, you know, the, the idea that if we use any of that lunar material that we would somehow be appropriating the, the moon, um, it, it just doesn't compute if you compare it to behaviors that we're engaged in in everyday life on, on Earth. So I think um, some of these things, as you tease them out, it's really going to put everyone's. Um, it, it's really going to put everyone's opinion on display as, as to what is the appropriate way um, to interpret these provisions. 
Um, so, so that, you know, Article 2 becomes very important to someone like, like Blue Origin. We're very much in line with what the administrator said this morning. Go up there, use those resources, sell them if you want for other folks to use the resources or to not use the resources as, as, as the case may be. Um, Article 6, the idea that we need to be transparent with our, um, our government partners, whether it's NASA or it's the Department of Commerce or the Department of Transportation, um, whomever it might be overseeing and authorizing our activities so that they're aware of what we're doing, you know, appropriately giving transparency into what our plans are so that those things can be coordinated with other um, actors from, from other countries. So I'm, I'm very excited about the fact that we are now actually practically exercising these things and no longer just sitting around um, talking about them in an, in an academic, which was always very exciting, but it's way more exciting to be testing them um, in, in practical application. Yeah, definitely. I think we're really testing the strength of what is known in the Outer Space Treaty by setting these precedents. Mm -hmm. um, to return back to uh, to Mike and to Tom. can jump in on that one. You know, yeah, what ahead. Audrey's really Mike, saying Mike, is, just, <laughs> Audrey's just saying it's great that we weren't completely wasting our time during all those hours. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Um, and, and let me say in regard to tuna, that's all Jim Bridenstine. That if it was me, you know, it'd be a baseball or a Star Trek analogy. That's so. exactly right. And and when we're on the topic, John, you know, John, for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, Flash lore, that's a DC Comics Flash reference with Star Labs. So I, I try and go deep cuts. John has absolutely exceeded me. So thank you, John. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just want to, again, uh, violent agreement and echo uh, everything that Audrey uh, and John had said. And while I'm very excited about operationalizing and getting into this future, I do want to make just a quick point relative to infrastructure. You know, I mentioned how important infrastructure is for sustainable space exploration in a physical sense, in a hardware sense relative to Gateway, but that's absolutely true from an institutional perspective as well. And this is the warning sign or the fear that I've got that our institutions, be it Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or even the way we deal with things in the U.S. government, they're set up for a government or government-to-government -government orientation, that they weren't structured to be able to accommodate the private sector. And as the space exploration evolves, and per the announcement today, and per the success of you know, commercial crew and COTS, uh, and like what John's talking about, space traffic management, private sector will have a huge role to play there. You know, the private sector is here. This isn't science fiction. This isn't theoretical. Obviously, it's arrived. And our institutions have to start reflecting that. And that's one of the reasons I was so excited to participate. And at the time, I was part of the private sector in the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group. The name still rolls off the tongue. And uh, Tanya, I think you were sitting right next to me uh, during those conversations. And what I appreciated about the Hague was that it brought together the private sector with government all around the same table able to have discussions that then fed in to COPUS. And I think that's a interesting system, a, a good mechanism. And we're going to have to have more of these conversations and more institutions or working groups that combine private sector with government. Because if we don't have that conversation in a robust manner with private sector entities, we won't get good policy. And speaking of not getting good policy, again, just following up on Audrey's point, it's so exciting that we're operationalizing because if you try and create too much policy without too much experience, it's not going to be good decisions that we need to learn on the moon. We need to go to Mars to be able to craft the policies, which again is why with the Artemis Accords, we're setting up a foundation based on the Outer Space Treaty, and then we'll be taking those experiences to multilateral forums in the future as we learn and operate on the moon in as safe and transparent a fashion as we possibly can. Great. Back to you, Chris. Sorry to Yeah, no problem. Um, you know, you know, you mentioned American leadership and America setting the pace uh, and establishing precedents. So I want to turn to to that and and think about some of the implications and context of setting precedents. Um, you know, Tanya, it seems I'd like your your uh, context in terms of this uh, resource use and procurement for it 
uh, it seems to be in accordance with the, the Hague Working Group. Um, but, you know, what we're going to see other, what, what if we are, or do see other nations, you know, do the same type of things, do the same type of procurements and assertion of property rights in space. Um, you know, these things certainly could play out, especially if America is going to be the leader on that. Uh, what are some of the implications of that? And, and perhaps Jesse Kate could also chime in uh, after. Well, you know, um, I, I wanted to just before I do that, uh, chime in on the on the tuna issue, um, because yes, uh, the analogy of fishing on the high seas has been uh, uh, made many times, but I think there is one uh, um, uh, specification that has to be made. It depends also whether resources are uh, scarce or not, and whether they are accessible easily for everybody. Eh? Because even if you, of course, have a plethora of, uh, of resources, water, platina, whatever, and everybody can go there, then it's fine. But if they are scarce, uh, or even if they are abundant, but they are difficult to reach, uh, then you do need uh, some, some governance and you can just not go and, and fish the tuna. Uh, and uh, I, I like the, um, the fact that uh, was mentioned that you need to get the industry around the table. And I think that was one of the big success factors of the Hague Working Group, which was initially met with quite some skepticism and perhaps still so I mean people were saying what's the mandate and what are you uh, what are you doing here but I think that 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 aspect of it uh, not only industry and and government but also all parts of the uh, of the world community countries were uh, were sitting around the table I mean you were also sitting next to a member of the Mexican Space Agency or the Indonesians or whatever so the the uh, that that inclusive inclusive that Jesse Kate also mentioned is very important. Um, and I think that we should uh, perhaps more than looking at law of the sea analogies, look at the International Telecommunication Union, where you have uh, that um, uh, aspect of involving industry. And, and I don't know how uh, we can do this in, in COPOS, but I think it would be a very good um, uh, development if something like that could be done, where you have sector members as they have an ITU. So they don't vote on the constitution and things like that, but they have a legitimate voice. They are not just part of a delegation. Of course, that happens now already, but then those, those industry partners are subject to uh, the instruction of the official delegation. But recognizing the actual players as uh, full-fledged discussion partners is, uh, is very important. And I think also another example that I wanted to bring here is the, is the fact of the management of, uh, for instance, the geostationary or satellite orbit, which is a scarce natural resource officially, uh, where you have a kind of dual system of, of ensuring that everybody does get access so that it is not uh, one takes all. But on the other hand, you also have a rational and efficient and effective management uh, requirement. So all those things are, um, I think, important to, uh, to um, ensure also for this manner of this matter of uh, uh, lunar governance. And now I forgot exactly what your question was. I wanted to bring these points down. I don't know. Can you repeat? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's setting a precedence. So if America does this, you know, we can predict it is possible, it is likely that other nations may also be asserting property rights and uh, for their own national, um, you know, space exploration and development goals. Um, that's not to be feared, perhaps, but, um, you know, do, do you see problems with that happening? Well, you have already seen that uh, after the United States made their law and, and ongoing processes, we have had uh, already two states that have gone the same way, Luxembourg and, and more recently the UAE, who have proclaimed laws about uh, ownership of space resources. And generally, these three are more or less aligned in, in what they do, in, in acknowledging that ownership of resources uh, can be is legitimate. However, uh, compliance with international treaty obligations has to be ensured. Uh, but of course, the risk is that uh, some other country which does not agree with the, with the way this thing is going might proclaim another kind of national law, saying we find that this is completely contrary to um, 
to international law and companies will not be allowed under our jurisdiction to own resources. And then the risk is that you would get some form of uh, a patchwork of, of national regimes that are not in harmony with each other. And I don't think that that is in the interest of everybody. So I'm going to be a little bit repetitive, but saying again that uh, having these laws puts, uh, puts matter on the table to discuss, but uh, eventually we will have to come together and, and find some compromise on, uh, on common principles. And you know, we had in, in UN COPOS, for instance, the uh, resolution on recommendations for national space legislation in, that was adopted in, I think, 2013. That gives eight recommendations to states that want to adopt a national space legislation to make uh, a legal framework for commercial space activities. Why couldn't we have something like that, a UN resolution that gives recommendations to states, uh, some common elements on uh, on such national legislation, because let's be uh, pragmatic also, before we get to anything um, substantive in the UN COPOS, it may take another 10 years. So I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, we will have actually commercial use of resources before then, it might not be, but should it be, I mean, then we do need uh, a plan B and then having some kind of uh, uh, agreement on at least the common denominator on the common principles uh, that, that I think would be, uh, would be perhaps a good first step. Definitely. Um, and I know that we have about 15 minutes left in our panel and I know that I do want to get to questions from our over 200 participants, we have a number of questions. But before I take a look at those questions, I want to ask Jesse Kate, um, you know, based on uh, that, uh, this announcement today, and, you know, based on what Tanya just has just said, are, you know, in terms of precedent setting, think five, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road, are we, is this setting off some type of um, land rush in space? for resources and is the only way around that to actually then agree that this needs to be discussed at the COPUS level with some type of COPUS or internationally deliberated instrument clarifying rights and obligations. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I, I love what Tanya was just saying about the idea of making recommendations to states. So um, I just wanna uh, reinforce that. Also, uh, I hope I don't drop off again. My apologies for uh, my internet connection. Uh, but let's have a go. Um, you know, my first thought is that is that the announcement uh, made by the administrator at, and that we're discussing here that really this accelerates the conversation about something that is in and of itself, as everybody has been saying, necessary for sustained human presence. And there's two elements of that. There's resource utilization of some kind, and eventually some kind of market activity. And in and of themselves, these are not bad things. I think the question, as usual, is about the implications. And uh, I think Jim said earlier, the resources extracted from the moon uh, will be owned by the people who invest their resources, equity and effort. And you know, that is certainly one way of doing it. Uh, but as we're talking about here with the, the tuna and the high seas, um, you know, there, there are questions of scarcity. Um, also, the, the tuna on the high seas is not just a free for all. Uh, there are regimes that manage how how we allocate utilization of those resources and regimes that talk about benefit sharing. And I know these are controversial terms, but I think these are the things that we're going to have to talk about. Uh, so there are many ways to make something ownable. Owning something uh, can have different rights and obligations associated with it. And that is where I think we need to kind of um, double click and get into the meat of these conversations when we um, make them sort of black and white, it actually makes it quite difficult to have the conversation. So I'm excited for us to have the opportunity to do so. And in that sense, I, I think what we're seeing here is, is, um, is a sort of first, first move. Um, and I really hope to see the international community respond, not just with a, a black and white response, but actually nuancing and complicating the conversation so that we don't just see polarization in response to this, but, um, but, but real substance. All right, great. All right, so the first question that, that caught my eye, um, part of it is from Michael Meeling. Um, he asks, do the panel members see any serious commercial customers on the economic horizon for lunar activity? Um, if not, what can be done to move beyond the build it and they will come perspective? So this is, you know, if, if NASA's buying 
uh, so a few grams of space resources? How do we go to that next step, you know, version 2.0 and, and start to actually build that lunar economy? And uh, anyone can, uh, if they have a perspective on that. So um, it was mentioned before that there's also the NAS Eclipse program, which is buying commercial payload services. So that this is actually kind of a step after that purchase. So I think there's a trend there for government. Um, some of the proposals that I've seen have been that once these commercial companies, it is a bill that they will come, but once these commercial companies have their own infrastructure and capabilities um, built for NASA, then other um, private companies will take advantage of that. And you do see that with the CLIPS payloads already, where they are going to deliver an, a NASA payload, but there are several commercial payloads that these companies also have secured that are going to ride with the NASA payload to the moon. So I think that's, to me, the very beginnings of this. Yeah, and if I could jump in on that one as well. First of all, let me say I'm a big fan of Field of Dreams. Great film. Uh, really believe in it. Um, and that you're right, Chris, uh, to point out the issue. And it's certainly a challenge. Frankly, whether it's Leo commercialization or creating the business case on the moon. And that's driving the announcement that was made this morning and will continue to be the fundamental issue that pushes NASA to take action, that we believe that NASA can serve as a catalyst to creating these commercial capabilities, then as a customer for those capabilities. And the hope is that by being a catalyst, by being the customer, that we can help create what then will be a dynamic business ecosystem where NASA can be just one customer among many. We've got a ways to go, which is why it's important that we get to the moon, operate, and discover what are the business cases that could work. I don't believe we've even scratched the surface of the business case and capabilities in low Earth orbit, much less on the moon. The important thing, just like in baseball, is to get out there get on the field, and then anything can happen as Field of Dreams showed. <laughs> um, thank you, Mike. There is a, a very precise question from Marsha Smith, Space Policy Online, that was from Mike. What is the total amount of money available, and are any countries excluded uh, from bidding on this RFP? So the total amount of money, and uh, Marsha, apologies if I get it wrong. I haven't uh, looked at the RFP this morning, but I believe it's about $50,000. Uh, please go back and verify the actual document. I'm bad with numbers, which is why you don't see me touching engineering, just a lawyer, policy, international specialist here. Uh, but I believe it's 50000 So the dollar figures are relatively low. Uh, also, as the administrator described, the amount of resources is going to be similarly small. But believe, we believe that the precedent, that uh, the importance of getting us out there on the field as we described, that's what this is intended to do, to act as a catalyst for that. And as I mentioned before, this is a global effort. We're not going to be the only ones going to the moon. We need to lead the world forward to the moon and beyond into the solar system. And that's why it's very appropriate that this solicitation is actually open globally. And I certainly hope that there will be global participation to help support the simple contention that you can extract resources and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Thank you for that, Mike. You know, I think um, when we're speaking about developing a commercial infrastructure and a commercial economy, a lunar economy, and at the same time, building the normative frameworks, the rules and regulations for that, there is this tension and we don't know what should come first. Um, you know, we don't want to have regulation that stifles innovation, stifles development of the an economic sphere. Um, but also, if you wait too late, then uh, it seems as though you, that type of activity can really get away from you and you, it's difficult to set the rules afterwards. So the timing of when we should be really drafting these, these lunar norms and lunar rules, you know, 
uh, we don't know whether it's it, how much should be done beforehand and how much should be done, um, you know, as it's happening, how much should be, we should wait for the activity to happen and then seek to, you know, regulate it and foster it. Um, so, you know, I, I'd invite some, any perspectives and reactions to, to that question, you know, do we need to do this beforehand or kind of the American approach or the common law approach is wait for the activity to happen and then, and then you can start to come up with rules. So it looks like uh, our resident Canadian, the other um, international uh, individual on our panel, Jesse Kate, uh, you have an answer, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I um, well actually it sort of speaks to the, uh, the previous question as well as this question, um, which is that in some senses, I think you know, these are chicken and the egg, but that's actually why baby steps and incremental capabilities uh, will be really helpful here. I have to say, you know, at first, uh, when I heard the announce announcement this morning, uh, one of the thoughts that went through my head for a minute was, oh, geez, like this is, um, this is just so, so small or, you know, I mean, I think, I think there will be a question about, is this even just a gimmick or is this, is this a real, you know, uh, is this really extracted? Are these really resources? What makes them resources? And uh, so I think there's a whole set of conversations to be had there. But actually, I think the fact that it's a, it's a very small incremental activity is, is actually really helpful because it still raises a ton of really big questions uh, that we will need to answer. And in doing so, we can have a tight feedback loop between the regulation and the policy and the capabilities. And, you know, I don't think anybody knows, I mean, as evidenced by the silence on the panel when you asked, I don't think anybody knows exactly how we're going to see uh, a rich, um, you know, economic activity in outer space or, or even, you know, what markets in space will look like. Uh, but again, emphasizing on the small uh, uh, incremental capabilities is what lets us, um, as Mike says, sort of get, get into the game uh, and, and get going. Go ahead, Tanya. Yeah, I think I would like to issue the magic word of the Hague Working Group again here, the adaptive governance. Um, I think we should, I mean, law should not precede technology, uh, but on the other hand, you have to be ready. So you have to uh, think of what is going to be necessary in the in the near or medium uh, term future and and uh, and have rules in place for that. And, and I think that is, uh, um, that is important, but you should not try to regulate now, uh, for instance, the use of space resources on Earth. I mean, before we are going to be able to bring them back to Earth, that will be far away. So incremental uh, regulation going hand in hand with what is expected to be reali realistic in terms of uh, technology, I think is the is the way forward. And you see that also with uh, human spaceflight cap capability. We have uh, companies that are uh, also receiving funding from NASA to be able to uh, make that step from, uh, from the space shuttle as a governmental uh, uh, transport system to SpaceX and Boeing doing it on a commercial basis. It is a stepwise approach. And so this um, uh, announcement by the administra administrator, I, I think that that is, done in the same sense. NASA will be, even if it's only $50,000, but is facilitating uh, the uh, the step towards towards commercial use. I think what will be interesting here is that you will have um, uh, one um, federal entity in the United States that will have to authorize and supervise this activity, which is in a way commissioned by another um, uh, administration uh, uh, institution of the government. So when when there's going to be a foreign company that is going to win this bid, it will be quite interesting how. Uh, the licensing and the supervision uh, will be done. And I, I hope that the US government would then also verify that a proper audit has taken place, that the activity can take place in a safe and sustainable manner, uh, taking into account international law. And, and Chris, if I can jump in on that one too, and rest assured that whenever you get silence from me, it's just me uh, struggling with my mute button that I always love to jump in on. Uh, commercialization of the moon conversation. Sorry, I was slow on that one. Um, just agree with everything that Jesse uh, and Tanya just said. And in direct response to your question, Chris, I say beware of false dichotomies. That the question isn't to regulate now uh, or later. We really, as Tanya mentioned, need law and technology 
to be in tandem, to be in partnership and to reinforce each other. So it's not either now or later, it's both that we need policies and regulations that will enable, that will empower uh, commercial activities and safe and sustainable exploration and science that we want to see in the future. Because if you're trying, even before an activity takes place, if you want to raise funding from a venture capital fund, or you're an investor yourself and want to put money forward, or you're even trying to get insurance, what you don't want to see is unpredictability. What you want is transparent. You want to be able to know what that regulatory environment is going to be. It's a question that investors will ask. So you do need a degree of certainty that you can provide the commercial sector moving forward. But we also shouldn't be arrogant relative to us having all of the answers at this stage. And this gets back to what Tanya was talking about uh, with The Hague, that we have to be able to update, to modernize, to treat our rules as organic, adaptive governance, because we're going to learn along the way. And that's why I say, and, and why we structured the Artemis Accords, taking a page from the Outer Space Treaty, which I love so much, uh, that it's a series of principles. Because we don't know enough really to go far beyond the principles now. Once we have that information, though, then we will. And I look forward to those bilateral and multilateral conversations that can take the operational experience that we've gained and create future policies and regulations to further enable growth, development, safety, and sustainability. Great. Thank you so much for that last comment. And I, th I believe we do have to end it there. I want to thank my panelists for this really fascinating discussion about the moon. It's a pleasure to speak with you about it and hear all these comments and, and perspectives.